Good afternoon. Good afternoon. <laughs> My name is Sarah Gergel and I work with the Living Archives Project where we are collecting stories of how COVID-19 impacted various communities in Charlotte Mecklenburg County. Today is May 30th, 2023, and this week there were 20 reported cases of COVID in Charlotte Mecklenburg County, which actually shows a decrease of 18% over the last two weeks. Mm -hmm. Therefore, each subject is comfortable not wearing a mask. Marilyn, would you introduce yourself? Yes, my name is Marilyn Twitty Brown. Uh, I will be 74 next month. Wow. And uh, I am a native Charlottean. I am a light-skinned African-American woman. I love to wear colorful jewelry. I make jewelry. And uh, I'm a very outgoing person. Beautiful. Thank you for that lovely introduction, Marilyn. You're welcome. So tell me, as a Charlotte native, you have seen <laughs> Charlotte grow in, and go through so many transitions. Oh, I have. Tell me if you can just reflect what is one or two things that really stands out to you? Well, all I could think about upon graduating from high school was getting out of Charlotte. <laughs> really? <laughs> because, yes, it was a very slow place with not a lot going on. And um, my family had taken me to some other cities, larger cities. And so I knew that there was more beyond Charlotte. Um, and then, though, upon retirement, I decided I wanted to come back to Charlotte. I had been coming back and forth home. And I saw a lot of the changes. And I moved back to Charlotte. Uh, I left in 67, and I moved back to Charlotte in 2012. And I moved into the house that I grew up in, the house my parents built in 1953. Marilyn, that is so beautiful. And I reconnected with my classmates and friends, and it's been a wonderful experience. The city has just grown so much, and there's so much to do culturally uh, and and sports, so many things yeah. that you can do here in Charlotte. And uh, I just think it's one of the best places to live. Oh, thank you for sharing that. Charlotte is incredible and it's beautiful to see that even if you left Charlotte, yes. you came back <laughs> and that's beautiful. So Marilyn, tell me a little bit about yourself. Well, uh, as I said, I was born in um, 1949. Uh, we were living with my grandparents. My mother was an elementary school teacher, and my father worked for North Carolina Mutual Life Insurance Company. And then uh, my parents built a house in McCrory Heights, and we are a hist we just got our historic designation this past August. We're trying to preserve the character and the integrity of the neighborhood. And so when we first uh, moved into our house, there were only about five other houses in the neighborhood. So uh, I pretty much became a tomboy <laughs> running through the woods with my dogs and so forth. But um, my father traveled a lot with North Carolina Mutual, and he went to several different states and he spent a lot of time in California. And as a matter of fact, he wanted to move us to California. So when I was 12 years old, my father flew us all out to California. I have a brother who's 10 years younger than me. And we spent one month there. And uh, we came back and my mother said, I'm not moving. <laughs> so we stayed in Charlotte. And my father continued to work. And then he came back home uh, permanently my junior year in high school. About that time, it was time for me to get ready to go to college, so I went off to college to Bradley University in Peoria, Illinois. <laughs> okay. And what did you study in college? Well, I studied commercial art, but what I did was after about two years, I think I had a little bit too much fun, and my father said, you need to come back home and get yourself together. And at that point, I really didn't want to go back to school. I really wanted to travel and see things, so uh, unbeknownst to my parents, well, I did sign up and go to Central Piedmont until I could make up my mind what I wanted to do. I sent an application to Delta Airlines, and about three weeks later, I was accepted, so I became a flight attendant. Wow. And I was uh, stationed in Dallas, Texas. Okay. 
Okay. And from Dallas, Texas, after flying for a few years, I moved to Los Angeles. And I lived out there for five and a half, six years. And then I moved back to Charlotte for two years. And then I met my first husband, uh, who was from Richmond, Virginia. So I moved to Richmond. And I, that's where I lived until 2012. And were you still a flight attendant? No, I wasn't. Okay. No. I, after I left Dallas, I stopped flying. Okay. Uh, when I moved to Richmond, I worked a couple of different jobs, but I ended up at a private girls' school, uh, St. Catherine's, which was an Episcopalian day and boarding school. Okay. And I was hired by the head of the school through an agency because he wanted to hire a person of color, and he knew that that was the only way he could do it was to go through an agency. Because otherwise, you know, uh, it would have seemed discriminatory uh, yeah. to everyone else. So when I, I went to the school, I knew what I was walking into. Uh, there were probably about five other black people that worked there. Wow. The majority of the housekeeping staff in the dining room were all black. But there were, um, there was boarding in grades 9 through 12. There were girls there from 24 different states and 10 foreign countries. And it was an interesting experience. I, uh, I worked there for 27 years. I actually ended up, when I uh, separated and divorced my first husband, I ended up living on campus for 16 years. So I was part of a residential community. Okay. Where we, um, and it was like home for the girls. And um, when we were on duty, we took them places on trips. And the thing about that job, I took it because... I wanted to make a difference, yeah. and I really did make a difference in terms of diversity and inclusion. Yeah. And the head of the school that I had, the two heads of the school, they were very, um, they were very interested in what I had to offer, and they were very interested in making sure that the students um, had a good array of experiences. Yeah. And so I was able to start a multicultural club. Uh, I took students out of town to different museums. We visited different ethnic restaurants. Uh, we went on fun field trips. Uh, I took three, well, two groups of students to South Africa for community service. So that school, the job allowed me to really do a lot of things that I wanted to do. Yeah. And because I went to a conference that I went to every year for the school, uh, I went to the wrong meeting. <laughs> which was unusual for me because uh, Virginia was in the Mid-Atlantic. And for some reason, I went to the Southeast meeting. I don't know why, but I didn't see anybody else from Virginia. And I kept thinking, where is everyone? Well, I put my name and address on a pad. And um, everybody ribbed me later on about how I'd missed the meeting. But what happened is, because I put my name on that pad, I got a flyer about world travelers to Egypt. And so I ended up going to Egypt with 11 total strangers for 11 days, 11,000 miles away. And it was a place I'd always wanted to go to. Wow. So, you know, not only in terms of academically yeah. did a lot of things happen, but a lot of things happened for me personally, too. That's amazing. And after my fourth year there, I got the yearbook from the senior class, um, which let me know I really had made an impact. And so when I stay in touch with a lot of the girls and uh, a lot of the faculty, and um, it was a wonderful experience. Thank you so much for sharing that. You're welcome. That is so beautiful. <laughs> so tell me, you re you retired and then you moved back to Charlotte. Yes, I retired in 2011 and I okay. moved back to Charlotte in 2012, remodeled the okay. home. Yeah. And things were going well yeah. for a while. <laughs> yes. So tell me, uh, what kind of your experience of being retired uh -huh. and then having this pandemic well and I'll tell you to start in 2017 okay. I had to have my um well no excuse me first of all yes in 2017 I had my left knee replaced okay. so that was pretty uneventful and then as we got closer to well we're in 2019 my right knee started bothering me mm. and I saw an orthopedic surgeon and he said to me that we need to replace your knee and I said, okay, uh, I'll do that in a little bit because my husband and I were looking at a trip for 2020. We were going to go to uh, Kuala Lumpur for our, you know, anniversary. Okay. And my knee had been bothering me a lot. And I said, you know, I don't think we should go 
because if I get over there, I can't walk around the way I want to. And so then we ended up scheduling my surgery for March 9th. Well, just about, you know, as you well know, we started hearing about COVID mm -hmm. in January, February, leading up to March. And so it didn't seem to be serious at the time. And my surgery was March 9th. That was on a Monday. On that Friday was when they cut off all the surgeries. Wow. Because of COVID. And so the first thing I thought is, well, I'll be at home for a few months because that's what they were saying. It was going to be fine. Yeah. And after that gives me time. I've got to rehab anyway. It doesn't matter. But it definitely didn't turn out to be that way. And, um, wow. <laughs> And I think about it, it really affected me, and I had no idea um, that it was going to to be that way. Yeah. I really didn't. You know, when people started getting sick and people started dying, um, it was pretty scary. Mm -hmm. And then my, um, I, my, this is my second husband that I'm with now. His daughter was married to a bus driver in Richmond, Virginia. And they both got COVID and went to the hospital. Mm -hmm. She went home. He didn't. Mm -hmm. And three and a half to four weeks later, he died. Wow. And he was a wonderful person. Mm -hmm. And that's when I think, the you know, it, it's not that I didn't think it was serious before that, but to be personally touched in that way. Yeah. And then so many things were happening. I've always dealt with slight depression issues, and I was on a mild medication. But when all of that started happening and when he, when he passed away, I immediately reached out to a therapist. And um, I started doing televisits. Mm -hmm. And also, um, I started having, my depression got worse, because mm -hmm. I normally had season affective disorder, you know, when it gets dark in the winter. But my depression got worse. You know, because it was everywhere. It was on the TV. It was in the paper. You couldn't mm -hmm. avoid it. And then um, I started having anxiety. Mm -hmm. And then I started having some OCD. I mean, I just just fully became somebody that I didn't recognize. And my husband was like, what is going on with you? He was having a hard time recognizing what was going on. They had to increase my medication. Yeah. Um, and so this affected me starting in the fall of 2020. And I think really I didn't basically sort of start coming out of it. Uh, well, not coming out of it, but getting better until about um, maybe summer of 2021. I felt like I had more of a handle on my emotions and my feelings. Um, thankfully, I didn't personally know anybody else who, who had passed from COVID, but so many other people you know, were having such terrible experiences. And also for the fact that my husband and I, my husband's nine years older than me, but we were going everywhere. We were going to museums, to jazz concerts, to music. We were traveling. And then all of a sudden, all of that just ended. All of that ended. And I felt like I was just sort of trapped in my house yeah. and couldn't go anywhere and couldn't do anything. And I'm, I'm pretty sure that that is what made everything so much worse for me. You know, and I was like, is this ever going to be over? Mm -hmm. Or what are things going to be like when it's over? Mm -hmm. You know, so I think not knowing what was going to happen um, it was really scary was really scary mm -hmm. and I mean I'm, I'm in a much better place now but of course when they start saying get your shots we got I got everything I've got all my boosters everything I wore my mask for a long time I finally my husband stopped wearing his before I did but I was still just nervous when I'd go in mm -hmm. um, this was last this past spring I'd go in a store what might be small I'd make sure I would put my mask on um, when we were in we would go to clubs and we'd go to movie theater. I'd have my mask on. Mm -hmm. And so finally, I just got rid of my mask probably uh, sometime in March of this past year. Mm -hmm. I started feeling comfortable because I saw so many other people yeah. without theirs on. And um, I felt a lot more comfortable. Yeah. And and now I still feel comfortable. Uh, we did get COVID. <laughs> 
We got it last June. We went to a wedding. We had a mask on up until time for dinner. And uh, I'm sure that's how I got it at the table. But, you know, it was so minor. Mm -hmm. I didn't even know I had it. Wow. Um, I woke up one morning with a little dry cough. Mm -hmm. and, so, and then my husband was doing a little dry cough. And then the next day, my head was stopped up and so was his. Well, he took a test. And he said, well, I don't have it, so you don't have it. And the next day, he got a little worse. And I was doing housework. I was fine. And I said, I'm going to take the COVID test. Well, we were positive. I found out why we didn't show up when he took it. He didn't follow the instructions. Oh. <laughs> so anyway, um, those next few days, I'd call my doctor, tell my doctor. But I mean, I was doing housework. Everything, it just yeah. didn't affect me. But my husband started having a little bit more congestion and he was coughing yeah. He for about a week or so. Um, and I went on and took the plaques of it. I probably didn't need it. Had I known that you could get a rebound, I probably wouldn't have taken it. But he did go get an infusion so he could hurry up and because it was in his chest. Mm -hmm. And um, that was the only experience we had with it. So, you know, I guess we're extra boosted now and everything. But um, I feel comfortable. Like I said, we traveled in um, April. We went to Barbados and um, none of us wore a mask. Mm -hmm. And so we feel fine. I, I don't. I didn't want to feel like I was being hostage to something after yeah. I saw so many other people and the numbers were going down yeah. and everything. So I felt a lot more comfortable. And now I feel much more at ease. Yeah. Much more at ease. Well, I wanted to say I'm so sorry for your loss. I can't yes. imagine how challenging that is. Yes. And his daughter is, you know, he was the love of her life. And so right. he still, she still, you know, is trying to come to grips because people didn't seem to take it seriously enough, you know, and on the bus and different things. So yeah. um, she's still, you know, trying to find her way out of it. Yeah. In terms of your mental health, how are you doing now? Oh, I'm, I'm fine now. I'm wonderful now. Um, I, um, let's see. Oh, it was 2021. I started feeling better. 22, uh, I would say starting probably last year, okay. um, early last year, I just really felt a lot more comfortable. Yeah. Like I said, I was still wearing the mask, though. Yeah. In, in, you know, you talked about therapy being yeah. so important Well, yes, for you. and let me tell you something. Therapy say, helped yeah. save my life, I think. Um, I got a hold of myself. I started doing a lot of meditation. Yeah. I found out that meditation is really very good. Because I would get so wound up, yeah. and I found out that, um, and of course I was eating eating properly and trying to keep exercising. Yeah. It's hard when you're depressed to to want to do that, but I did, and so um, I did everything I needed to do. And as a matter of fact, I still talk to a therapist once a month because <laughs> I think it's really helpful, you know, just to to deal with issues. But I don't have any COVID fears or COVID anxiety of any of that anymore. That finally went away last year. Well, I'm so glad to hear that that those fears because those are strong. They things. really were, and it yeah. just it took me right to a point where I I'd never had anxiety before, which yeah. made it worse. Yeah. And the OCD thing, I mean, I, I just couldn't believe how bad it got. It, it really, my husband was like, you got you to cut this out. And I'm saying, I can't help myself. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, uh, he talked to my therapist to really try to understand what I was going through. Mm -hmm. But um, it, it, it. I never got to the point where I didn't want to live or didn't want, want didn't want to take want mm -hmm. to take my life or anything. Ne never thought about anything like that. Mm -hmm. But I was just very stressed out during mm -hmm. that over that year or so. Mm -hmm. I can imagine. How did you see your family? Other, you know, you did talk a little bit about um, your son-in-law. Right. Well, or your husband's son-in-law. Yes. Right? Mm -hmm. And how else did you feel like your maybe your husband? Because you were home with your husband. Yeah, I was home with him all the time. And I, I, uh, my oldest son, my younger son, passed in 2010. So I have one son now, mm -hmm. and he's uh, 47. And uh, we talked on the phone a lot. I think the first time I actually saw him after we had COVID was in. He came down and surprised me in 2021. He just got in the car and drove down to check mm -hmm. on me. So it was so good to see him. Yeah. 
But, you know, in, in terms of just, uh, we did a couple of um, video visits with friends yeah. and things, but I probably didn't do as much of that as I could have because at the time I just wasn't yeah. feeling it. Yeah, I can imagine. And I was just sort of in this dark place. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I can imagine. Did you feel like, you mentioned your husband talked to your therapist, did you feel like he was a support system for you in that time? He was when he finally sort of, he, he understood the depression, yeah. um, the anxiety, but the LCD was kind of hard for him because... <laughs> I didn't quite make it easy for him, you know. I, I was like, you know, uh, the, did you lock the door? Did you did you do the this? Did you? And so the OCD was something he'd never experienced, and nothing I had truly experienced before. Um, and it was a little, it was a little taxing. I will say we had, you know, we had, we had some nice little arguments about it and different things, but um, we worked through it. We worked through it. It's beautiful. You work through it. Yeah, we, we worked through it. We had to work through it. Yeah, yeah. Um, before we started our conversation, we did an activity together called a hand map. Right. Is there anything from your hand map that you'd like to share with us? Well. And you might have already shared some things. No, I've shared some things. I would say the one thing about myself is that I call myself a playmaker. Okay. And that is because... I have always had this ability to get people together to do things. Mm -hmm. And uh, for instance, when I lived in, uh, <laughs> when I was uh, in school for Delta Airlines, you know, they were very strict when I became, we, we were stewardesses then. We became flight attendants about one year after because the men joined. But anyway, I would get everybody together and we would go out and club and come back. We'd get somebody to meet us two blocks away and things. But when I got to California, I had about six very good girlfriends and I would always plan some place for us to go and something to do. And even back then in the early 70s, we had a designated driver. And so everybody got together. When I left, a few people stayed together, but some other went their way. Yeah. And then when I uh, worked at St. Catherine School, there were nine of us from different uh, teachers and, and, and uh, heads of different departments would get together and go to lunch or go to dinner, actually, um, once a month. And then also I was able to get the faculty rallied to do a faculty staff talent show for the students. I also for Christmas planned a big Christmas party and we'd all exchange gifts. But now the group that I had dinner with, the nine people after I left, they basically stopped getting together. Really? Yes. Yes. Which is glue that kept them I think so, I think <laughs> so. But that's that's what I've always uh and I think I got, I know I got that from my father because my father was a very outgoing person. Yeah. But I've always been able to rally people together to do things. And like just now I work with my um, high school class mates and uh, help, I'm an event planner. I was also an event planner at St. Catherine's for dances and things. So that's, that's sort of my forte. That's something I like to do is get people together. Yeah, I love that. Do you find that... Now that we're out of the restrictions and if there's more freedom, that you have all these ideas in your head. Well, I have. I've already called our class president and said yeah. we need to do breakfast or lunch in June. <laughs> yeah. And then with a few of the girlfriends, uh, we're going to get together and do a few things. Yeah, that's so wonderful. So how do you think, now that we're reflecting, we have been out of the, the hard isolation, mm -hmm. high restriction season, and now, even though COVID is still impacting us in various ways, mm -hmm. um, we're doing this new normal, as some people like to say. How do you feel like it's, it is for you, this new normal? Well, it is a new normal, but every once in a while in the back of your head, it's going to be like, when is it going to happen again? And, you know, I never thought about us having anything like COVID. It just never crossed my mind. Probably didn't with a lot of people. That was something that was happening in China and other places. Mm -hmm. And so they've already talked, they've already planted a seed in our heads about when the next pandemic comes. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure some people will ignore it. 
mm-hmm. like they ignored COVID mm-hmm. when it came. Um, and then for other people, it probably frightens them, mm-hmm. the thought of it. Um, I don't think about it in that way. I don't, if it comes, it comes, but I'm not going to, to labor on it. I'm not going to worry about if it's going to come or when it's going to come or what's going to happen. Mm-hmm. Because um, I could be here today and gone tomorrow mm-hmm. from something else. And that's something I try not to dwell on. I try to always live in a positive way and uh, move forward. I love that. Marilyn, is there anything else that you would like to share with us? Before mm, let me look at my little sheet. <laughs> and it doesn't have to necessarily be COVID-related. Right, it can right. Just be anything. Well, you know, as we get older, <laughs> Of course, we get wiser and we think of so many things that we've done and how we could have done other things. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, people always ask me if you could change something in your life, you know, Mm -hmm. what would it be, a time, a place, whatever. And I thought about that and I said, no, I wouldn't change a thing. And I tell you why. If I change one thing, I might not have had my children. Mm -hmm. I might not have met my husband. I might not have had a job that I loved for 27 years. So I don't dwell on wanting to change one thing about my life. I could even say I want this arthritis to go away. But it is what it is, and I accept it. And um, I try to live each life, each day to the fullest, I Mm -hmm. do, and not dwell on negative things. I love that. Thank you, Marilyn. You're very welcome. Thank you so much for just being so genuine and sharing your story with us today. You're very welcome.